Hare Krishna everyone. Welcome back to the live studios here in Wisteria College. College? Cottage. Wisteria Cottage. Well, it is a college, college also. It's a college for learning the Srimad Bhagavatam. Freudian slip. Wisteria College. Just down the road from Folkestone, which is on the way to Canterbury, on the main road, on, in Kent, UK. And we're turning this place into a nice spiritual abode. Uh, Bhakta Matt is, I, I now have a traveling techie, and he's uh, making all these arrangements to show things through the, 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 the flat screen that's in the, in the room, and he's showing the, now he's got the Veda base there on the screen so we can all read it, just in case you want to read it and follow along there. Easier on your eyes, maybe. And welcome to all of you out there in cyberspace. Thank you for coming. Uh, we hope that you enjoy more and more, and we hope that you share more and more, so that more and more devotees can hear the Bhagavatam every day and get the nectar and the benefit, uh, the supreme benefit of associating directly with Krishna. All right. Sanatana Goswami is the senior <clears throat> disciple of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, personally hearing from Chaitanya Mahaprabhu for a longer period of time than any other personality on the planet. And therefore he was very dear to Lord Chaitanya and Lord Chaitanya said that he is the most learned, the most he knows more than anybody. And he wrote this beautiful prayer to the Srimad Bhagavatam. It's a part of his book called Sri Krishna Lila Stava, which is a very short book and it's his, his attempt to offer 108 obeisances to the Vrindavan pastimes of Krishna. And this is the 107th obeisance, and it's particularly to the Srimad Bhagavatam. It's called Srimad Bhagavata Mahima Stotram, and it goes like this Sarva Shastrabdi Piyusha, Sarva Vedaika Satpala. Sarva Siddhanta Ratnadya, Sarva Lokaika Drikprada. O nectar from the ocean of all scriptures, singular fruit of all the Vedas, rich mine of the precious gems of all conclusive truths, you are the only giver of sight to all the worlds. Sarva Bhagavata Prana, Srimad Bhagavata Prabho, Kalidvandurita Ditya, Shri Krishna Parivartita. O life heir of all the Supreme Lord's devotees, O Master, Srimad Bhagavatam, you are the sun risen in the darkness of Kali. You are the exact image of Shri Krishna. Paramananda Pataya, Prema Varshaksharayate, Sarvada Sarvasevyaya, Shri Krishnaya Namostume. I bow down to you, who were supremely blissful to read. Your every syllable pours down a flood of prema. You can always be served by everyone. You are Sri Krishna himself. Madeka bando matsangin, madguro man mahadana, man nishtadagamad bhagya, mad ananda namostute. My only friend, my constant companion, my spiritual master, my great wealth, my savior, my good fortune, my source of ecstasy. I bow down to you. A sadhu, sadhu tad dayin, achini tu tatakara, hanamun chakadachin mam, premna red kanta yospuda. O bestower of saintliness to the unsaintly, O exalter of the most fallen, Please never leave me. Always appear in my heart and my voice with pure love. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. So, Lord Brahma has been instructed by 
Lord Vishnu himself to perform tapasya. Tapasya is the uh, only occupation for the human being. Only the human being of all the other species of life can perform tapasya. And he sat in meditation for a thousand years, celestial years, and as a reward, Krishna revealed to him the spiritual world, including his spiritual form. And after being amazed, uh, he glorified the Lord. And now the Lord is speaking to him, explaining to him what he's seeing and answering uh, the questions that Maharaj Prikit asked uh, of Shukadeva Goswami. He asked in the eighth chapter a long series of questions that were so deep, practically the, the questions show that he knew everything anyway. <coughs> Couldn't answer, ask all these questions unless you knew what the answers were. But anyway, for our benefit, he asked all these questions. And now, Shukadev Goswami is explaining, you know, uh, what Krishna said to Brahma. And we've come to the 33rd verse of the ninth chapter of the second canto, which is the beginning of the four seed verses of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Uh, the Srimad Bhagavatam is eternal. The sounds are eternal. Uh, but just as Krishna is eternal, but sometimes he appears and sometimes disappears. But he's eternal. It's not that he dies when he disappears, like our form dies. Uh, so he's going to explain the essence of spiritual philosophy in four verses. So this is very deep and the purports are very extensive. So you put on your thinking caps, turn up your antennas, your spiritual antennas, turn them, put them all the way up, right? And let's hear. This is Krishna speaking to Brahma. Aham evasame vagre Nanyad yat sadasat padam Paschat aham yare tach cha Yo vishishyet tisos myaham Brahma, it is I, the supreme, the personality of Godhead who was existing before the creation when there was nothing but myself nor was there the material nature, the cause of this creation. That which you see now is also I, the personality of Godhead. And after the annihilation, what remains will also be I, the personality of Godhead. What's the problem? There is a message of Yadutama who says, Hare Krishna, the feed keeps getting interrupted. Well, it must be from you because it's not being interrupted from here. No. Is it being interrupted from here? No. That means it's from him. Okay. My dear Yadutama, thank you for your message. The answer is that from here the signal is strong and fine, but from where you're sitting in Russia, it may not be. So we apologize for that. But what can I say? You decided to go there. <laughs> Not that we're trying to encourage you not to stay there. We, we want you to stay there. Your devotional service is there. But you have to tolerate this. Okay, sometimes the connection between one place and another is perfect. Sometimes it's not. But uh, we're not going to interrupt the reading. As a matter of fact, I'm going to go and I'm going to read that verse again. And I'm not going to be interrupted again until the reading is finished. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Verse 33, chapter 9. Canto 2 Brahma, <clears throat> it is I, the personality of Godhead, who was existing before the creation, when there was nothing but myself. 
nor was there the material nature, the cause of this creation. That which you see now is also I, the personality of Godhead. And after annihilation, what remains will also be I, the personality of Godhead. Purport by His Divine Grace, Srila Prabhupada. We should note very carefully that the, that the personality of Godhead is addressing Lord Brahma and specifying with great emphasis himself, pointing out that it is he, the personality of Godhead, who existed before the creation, it is he only who maintains the creation, and it is he only who remains after the annihilation of the creation. Brahma is also a creation of the Supreme Lord. The impersonalist puts forth the theory of oneness in the sense that Brahma, also being the same principle of I, because he is an emanation from the I, the Absolute Truth, is identical with the Lord, the principle of I. And that, th and that there is nothing, and that there is thus nothing more than the principle of I, is explained in this verse. Even if we accept the argument of the impersonalist, it is to be admitted that the Lord is the creator I, and that Brahma is the created I. Therefore, there is a difference between the two I's, namely the predominator I and the predominated I. Therefore, there are still two I's. Even if we accept the argument of the impersonalist. But we must note carefully that in the Vedic literature, these two eyes are accepted as only one in the sense of quality. The Kato Upanishad says, Nityo Nityanam Chaitanas Chaitananam Eko Bahunam Yo Vidadati Kamam. The Creator Eye and the Created Eye are accepted in the Vedas as qualitatively one because both of them are nityas and chaitanas. But the singular I is, is the creator I, and the created eyes are of plural number because there are many eyes like Brahma and those generated by Brahma. It is the simple truth. The father creates or begets a son, and the son also creates many other sons, and all of them may be one as human beings, but at the same time, the father, the son, and the grandsons are all different. The son cannot take the place of the father, nor can the grandsons. Simultaneously, the father, the son, and the grandson are one and different also. As human beings, they are one, but as relativities, they are different. Therefore, the relativities of the creator and the created, or the predominator and the predominated, have been differentiated in the Vedas by saying that the predominator I is the feeder of the predominated eyes. And thus, there is a vast difference between the two principles of I. In another feature of this verse, no one can deny the personalities of both the Lord and Brahma. Therefore, in the ultimate issue, both the predominator and the predominated are persons. This conclusion refutes the conclusion of the impersonalist that in the ultimate issue everything is impersonal. This impersonal feature, stressed by the less intelligent impersonalist school, is refuted by pointing out that the predominator I is the absolute truth and that he is a person. The predominated I, Brahma, is also a person, but he is not the absolute. For realization of oneself in spiritual psychology, it may be convenient to assume oneself to be the same principle as the absolute truth, but there is always the difference of the predominated and the predominator, as clearly pointed out here in this verse, which is grossly misused by the impersonalists. 
Brahma is factually seeing face to face his predominator Lord, who exists in the transcendental eternal form even after the annihilation of the material creation. The form of the Lord, as seen by Brahma, existed before the creation of Brahma, and the material manifestation, with all the ingredients and agents of material creation, is an expansion of the Lord's energies. And after the exib ex exhibition of the Lord's energies come to, comes to a close, what remains is the same personality of Godhead. Therefore, the form of the Lord exists in all circumstances of creation, maintenance, and annihilation. The Vedic hymns confirm this fact in the statements, Vasudevo va idam agra asin na brahma na jashankara ekovai narayana asin na brahma nishanaha, etc. <clears throat> Before the creation, there was none except Vasudeva. There was neither Brahma nor Shankara. Only Narayana was there and no one else, neither Brahma nor Ishana. Sripad Shankaracharya also confirms the, in his comments on the Bhagavad Gita that Narayana, or the personality of Godhead, is transcendental to all creation, but that the whole creation is a product of the abhyakta. Therefore the difference between the creator and the created is always there, although both the creator and created are of the same quality. Another feature of this verse is the statement that the supreme truth is Bhagavan, or the personality of Godhead. The personality of Godhead and his kingdom have already been explained. The kingdom of Godhead is not void as conceived by the impersonalists. The Vaikuntha planets are full of transcendental variegatedness, including the four-handed residents of those planets with great opulence of wealth and prosperity. And there are even airplanes and other amenities required for high-grade personalities. Therefore, the personality of Godhead exists before the creation and he exists with all transcendental variegatedness in the Vaikuntha Lokas. The Vaikuntha Lokas also accepted in the Bhagavad Gita as being diff as accepted in the Bhagavad Gita, the, the Vaikuntha Lokas also accepted in the Bhagavad Gita as being the Sanatan nature are not annihilated even after the annihilation of the manifested cosmos. Those transcendental planets are of a different nature altogether, and that nature is not subjected to the rules and regulations of material creation, maintenance, and annihilation. The existence of the Personality of Godhead implies the existence of the Vaikuntha Lokas, as the existence of a king implies the existence of a kingdom. In various places, in Srimad Bhagavatam and in other revealed scriptures, the existence of the Personality of Godhead is mentioned. For example, in Srimad Bhagavatam 2.8.10, Maharaj Parikshit asks, Sachapi yatra purusho vishwastit yudbhavat piyayaha muktvatma maya maya mayeshwa Muktvatma mayam mayesha shetisarva guhasrayaha. How does the personality of Godhead, the cause of creation, maintenance, and annihilation, who is always freed from the influence of the illusory energy and is the controller of the same, lie in everyone's heart? Similar also is a question of Viduras. Tatvanam Bhagavan Tesham Katida Patisangramaha Tatremam Ka Upasidan Ka Uswid Anusherate Bhagavatam 3737. In his notes, Sridhar Swami explains that the latter part of this verse 
during the period when the creation has been annihilated, who serves the Lord as he lies on Shesha, indicates that the transcendental Lord, with all his names, fame, and qualities and paraphernalia, exists eternally. The same confirmation is also in the Kashi Kanda of the Skanda Purana, in connection with the Dhruva Charita. It is said there, Na Chaiman, Na Chaivante, Pijad Bhakta, Mahatyam, Pralayapadi, Ato Chuto Kilak Loke, Kilek Loke, Saeka Sarvago Vyabdaha. Not to speak of the personality of God in Himself, <clears throat> even His devotees are not annihilated during the period of the annihilation of the entire material world. The Lord is ever existent in all three stages of material change. The impersonalist adduces no activity in the Supreme, but in this discussion between Brahma and the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the Lord is said to have activities also, as He has His form and qualities. The activities of Brahma and other demigods during the maintenance of the creation are to be understood as the activities of the Lord. The king or the head executive of, of a state may not be seen in the government offices, for he may be engaged in royal comforts. Yet it should be understood that everything is being done under his direction and everything is, is at his command. The personality of God it is never formless. In the material world he may not be visible in his personal form to the less intelligent class of men, and therefore he may sometimes be called formless. But actually, he is always in his eternal form, in his Vaikuntha planets, as well as in other planets of the universes, as different incarnations. The example of the sun is very appropriate in this connection. At night, the sun may not be visible to the eyes of men in the darkness, but the sun is visible wherever it is risen. That the sun is not visible to the eyes of the inhabitants of a particular part of the earth does not mean that the sun has no form. In the Brihad Aranyaka Upanishad, there is the hymn, At Mai Vedam Agra Asit Purashavidaha. This mantra indicates that the Supreme Personality of Godhead Krishna existed even before the appearance of the Purusha Incarnation. In the Bhagavad Gita, it is said that Lord Krishna is the Purushottama, the Supreme Purusha, because he is transcendental even to the Akarsha Purusha and the Karsha Purusha. The Akarsha Purusha, or the Mahavishnu, throws his glance over Prakriti, or material nature, but the Purushottama existed even before that. The Briyad Aranyaka Upanishad therefore confirms the statement of the Bhagavad Gita that Lord Krishna is the Supreme Person, Purushottama. In some of the Vedas, it is also said that in the beginning only the impersonal Brahman existed. However, according to the present verse of Srimad Bhagavatam, the impersonal Brahman, which is the glowing effulgence of the body of the Supreme Lord, may be called the immediate cause. Is there a reason why there's a shadow across the... Can you see that? There's a shadow across the... It may, it's hard to... No, that doesn't take it out. It's like it's built in, looks like. Yeah, the TV might be a little messed up. Maybe. But it's readable. Is it readable? Mm -hmm. Okay. Beginning of the paragraph. <clears throat> In some Vedas, in some of the Vedas, it is also said that in the beginning only the impersonal Brahman existed. However, according to the present verse of Srimad Bhagavatam, the impersonal Brahman, which is the glowing effulgence of the body of the Supreme Lord, may be called the immediate cause, but the cause of all cause, or the remote cause, is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The Lord's impersonal feature is existent in the material world because of material senses, 
because by material senses or material eyes the Lord cannot be seen or perceived. One has to spiritualize the senses before one can, before one can expect to see or perceive the Supreme Lord. But he is always engaged in his personal capacity and he is eternally visible to the inhabitants of Vaikuntaloka, eye to eye. <clears throat> Therefore, he is materially impersonal, just as the executive head of the state may be impersonal in the government office, although he is not impersonal in the government house. Similarly, the Lord is not impersonal in his abode which is always nirasta kuhakam, as stated in the very beginning of the Bhagavatam. Therefore, both the impersonal and personal features of the Lord are acceptable, as mentioned in the revealed scriptures. This dual quality of the personality of Godhead is very emphatically stated in the Bhagavad Gita, in the, in the verse beginning, Brahmano hi pratishtaham. 1427. Therefore, in all ways, the confidential part of the spirit of spiritual knowledge is realized, realization, here I'll read that again. Therefore, in all ways, the confidential part of spiritual knowledge is realization of the personality of Godhead and not his impersonal Brahman feature. One should therefore have his ultimate aim of realization not in the impersonal feature, but in the personal feature of the Absolute Truth. The example of the sky within the pot and the sky outside the pot may be helpful to the student for his realization of the all-pervading quality of the cosmic consciousness of the Absolute Truth. But that does not mean that the individual part and parcel of the Lord becomes the Supreme by a false claim. It means only that the conditioned soul is a victim of the illusory energy in her last snare. To claim to be one with the cosmic consciousness of the Lord is the last trap set by the illusory energy, or daivi, maya. Even in the impersonal existence of the Lord, even in the impersonal existence of the Lord, as it is in the material creation, one should aspire for a personal realization of the Lord. And that is the meaning of paschat aham yat eight touch chayo vishayet sosmyaham. Brahmaji also accepted the same truth <clears throat> when he was instructing Narada. He said, So yam te bihitas tata bhagavan vishwabhavanaha. That's 2750. There is no cause of all causes other than the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Hari. Therefore, the verse under discussion, beginning Aham Eva, never indicates anything other than the Supreme Lord. And one should therefore follow the path of the Brahma Sampradaya, or the path from Brahmaji to Narada, to Vyasadeva, etc., and make it a point in life to realize the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Hari, or Lord Krishna. This very confidential instruction to the pure devotees of the Lord was also given to Arjuna, as well as to Brahma in the beginning of the creation. The demigods like Brahma, Vishnu, Maheshwara, Indra, Chandra, and Varuna are undoubtedly different forms of the Lord for execution of different functions, and the different elemental ingredients of material creation as well as the multifarious energies or emanations of the same personality of Godhead. But the root of all of them is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna. One should be attached to the root of everything rather than bewildered by the branches and leaves. That is the instruction given in this verse. Text 34. Ritertam 
yad pratiyeta na pratiyeta chatmani tad vidyad atmano mayam yatha bhaso yatha tamaha O Brahma, whatever appears to be of any value, if it is without relation to me, has no reality. Know it is my illusory energy, that reflection which appears to be in darkness. Purport. In the previous verse, it has already been concluded that at any stage, the cosmic manifestation Oh, that's a better sign. You got it bigger, huh? That's nice now. It's better. <clears throat> in the previous verse, it has already been concluded that at in that in any stage of the the cosmic of the cosmic manifestation, its appearance, its sustenance, its growth, its interactions of different energies, its deterioration, and its disappearance, all has its basic relation with the existence of the Personality of Godhead. And as such, whenever there is forgetfulness of this prime relation with the Lord, and whenever things are accepted as real without being related to the Lord, that conception is called a product of the illusory energy of the Lord. Because nothing can exist without the Lord, it should be known that the illusory energy is also an energy of the Lord. The right conclusion of dovetailing everything in relationship with the Lord is called Yogamaya, or the energy of union. And the wrong conception of detaching a thing from its relationship with the Lord is called the Lord's Daiv Maya, or Maha Maya. Both Mayas also have connections with the Lord because nothing can exist without being related to Him. As such, the wrong conception of detaching relationships from the Lord is not false but illusory. Misgiving one thing for another thing is called illusion. For example, accepting a rope as a snake is illusion but the rope is not false. The rope, as it exists in front of the illusioned person, is not at all false, but accepting it as the snake is illusory. Therefore, this material manifestation is not false, but the wrong conception of accepting the material manifestation as being divorced from the energy of the Lord is illusion. And this illusory conception is called the reflection of reality in the darkness of ignorance. Anything that appears not to be produced out of my energy is called maya. The conception that the living entity is formless or that the Supreme Lord is formless is also illusion. In the Bhagavad Gita 2.12, it was said by the Lord in the midst of the battlefield, that the warriors standing in front of Arjuna, Arjuna himself, and even the Lord, had all existed before. They were existing on the battlefield of Hrushetra, and they would all continue to be individual personalities in the future also, even after the annihilation of the present body, and even after being liberated from the bondage of material existence. In all circumstances, the Lord and the living entities are individual personalities, and the personal features of both the Lord and the living beings are never abolished. Only the influence of illusory energy, the reflection of light in the darkness, can, by the mercy of the Lord, be removed. In, that, in the material world, the light of the sun is, not, is also not independent, nor is that of the moon. The real source of light is the Brahma Jyoti, which diffuses light from the transcendental body of the Lord. And the same light is reflected 
in varieties of light, the light of the sun, the light of the moon, the light of fire, the light of electricity. So the identity of the self as being unconnected with the Supreme Self, the Lord, is also illusion. And the false claim, I am the Supreme, is the last illusory snare of the same Maya or the external energy of the Lord. The Vedanta Sutra in the very beginning affirms that everything is born from the Supreme. And thus, as explained in the previous verse, all individual living entities are born from the energy of the Supreme Living Being, the Personality of Godhead. Brahma himself was born from the energy of the Lord, and all other living entities are born from the energy of the Lord through the agency of Brahma. None of them has any existence without being dovetailed with the Supreme Lord. The independence of any individual living in entity is not real independence, but is just the reflection of the real independence existing in the Supreme Being, the Lord. The false claim of supreme independence by the conditioned souls is illusion. And this conclusion is stated in this verse. Persons with a poor fund of knowledge become illusioned, and therefore the so-called scientists, physiologists, empiric philosophers, etc., become dazzled by the glaring reflection of the sun, moon, electricity, etc., and deny the existence of the Supreme Lord, putting forward theories and different speculations about the creation, maintenance, and annihilation of everything material. The medical practitioner may deny the existence of the soul in the physiological bodily construction of an individual person, but he cannot give life to a dead body, even though all the mechanisms of the body exist even after death. The psychologist makes a serious study of the physiological conditions of the brain as if the construction of the cerebral lump were the machine of the functioning mind. But in the dead body, the psychologist cannot bring back the function of the mind. These scientific studies of the cosmic manifestation or the bodily construction independent of the Supreme Lord are different reflective intellectual gymnastics only. But at the end, they are all illusion and nothing more. All such advancement of science and knowledge in the present context of material civilization is but an action of the covering influence of the illusory energy. That's a profound statement. I'll say that again. All such advancement of science and knowledge in the present context of material civilization is but an action of the covering influence of illusory energy. So what's the evidence of that? The very scientists, the very discoverers of their theories or whatever, they die. And, and what is that, those discoveries to them? And then another one comes and makes another discovery, it changes the other one, and then he dies. And what's it to him? And it keeps going on like that, changing, 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 until the whole universe is annihilated. And what's it to anybody? But in the spiritual world, nothing is deteriorated. Nothing, nothing changes. No forms change. Therefore, it's relevant to everyone, in Krishna and the living beings. All such advancement of science and knowledge in the present context of material civilization is but an action of the covering influence of the illusory energy. The illusory energy has two phases of existence, namely the covering influence and the throwing influence. By the throwing influence, the illusory energy throws the living entities into the darkness of ignorance and by the covering influence, she covers the eyes of men possessing a poor fund of knowledge about the existence of the Supreme Person, who enlightened the Supreme Individual Living Being, 
Brahma. The identity of Brahma with the Supreme Lord is never claimed herein, and therefore such a foolish claim by the man with a poor fund of knowledge is another display of the illusory energy of the Lord. The Lord says in the Bhagavad Gita, 16.18-20, that demoniac persons who deny the existence of the Lord are thrown more and more into the darkness of ignorance. And thus, such demoniac persons transmigrate life after life without any knowledge of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The sane man, however, is enlightened in the disciplic succession from Brahmaji, who was personally instructed by the Lord at the beginning of creation, or in the disciplic succession from Arjuna, who was personally instructed by the Lord in the Bhagavad Gita. The sane man thus accepts this statement of the Lord. Ahang sarvasya prabhavo matak sarvam pravartitam itimat vabhajante imam buddha bhava samanvitaha The Lord is the original source of all emanations and everything that is created, maintained and annihilated exists by the energy of the Lord. The sane man who knows this is actually learned and therefore he becomes a pure devotee of the Lord, engaged in the transcendental loving service of the Lord. Shiva Prabhupada Ki Jai. Although the reflective energy of the Lord displays various illusions to the eyes of persons with a poor fund of knowledge, the sane person knows clearly that the Lord can act even from far, far beyond our vision by his different energies, just as fire can diffuse heat and light from a distant place. In the medical science of the ancient sages known as the Ayurveda, there is definite acceptance of the Lord's supremacy in the following words, Jagat yoner anichasya chit anandai karupinaha pungsosti prakritir nitya pratichaye vabhasvataha achinapi Achinana Pichaitanya Yogina Paramatmanaha Akarod Vishumakilam Anityam Nataka Kritam Kakritim. There is one supreme person who is the progenitor of this cosmic manifestation and whose energy acts as prakriti or the material nature, dazzling like a reflection. By such illusory action of Prakriti, even dead matter is caused to move by the cooperation of the living energy of the Lord, and the material world appears like a dramatic performance to the ignorant eyes. The ignorant person, therefore, may be a scientist or physiologist in the drama of Prakriti, <laughs> while the sane person knows Prakriti as the illusory energy of the Lord. By such a conclusion, as confirmed by the Bhagavad Gita, it is clear that the living entities are also a display of the Lord's superior energy, para, prakriti. Just as the material world it is, is a display of the Lord's inferior energy, apara, prakriti. The superior energy of the Lord cannot be as good as the Lord, although there is very little difference between the energy and the possessor of the energy. Or the heat, and the uh, or the heat and the fire. Fire is possessed of heat, but heat is not fire. This simple thing is not understood by the man with the poor fund of knowledge, who falsely claims that the fire and the heat are the same. The energy of the fire, namely heat, is explained here as a reflection, and not directly fire. Therefore, the living entity represented by the living entities is, a, is the reflection of the Lord and never the Lord himself. Being the reflection of the Lord, the existence of the living entity is dependent on the Supreme Lord, who is the original light. This material energy may be compared to darkness as actually it is darkness. And the activities of the living entities in the darkness are reflections 
of the original light. The Lord should be understood by the context of this verse. Non-dependence of both the energies of the Lord is explained as maya or illusion. No one can make a solution of the darkness of ignorance simply by the reflection of light. Similarly, no one can come out of material existence simply by the reflected light of the common man. One has to receive the light from the original light itself. The reflection of sunlight in the darkness is unable to drive out the darkness, but the sunlight outside the reflection can drive out the darkness completely. In darkness, no one can see the things in a room. Therefore, a person in the dark is afraid of snakes and scorpions, although there may not be such things. But in the light, the things in the room can be clearly seen, and the fear of snakes and scorpions is at once removed. Therefore, one has to take shelter of the light of the Lord, as in the Bhagavad Gita or the Srimad Bhagavatam, and not the reflective personalities who have no touch with the Lord. No one should hear the Bhagavad Gita or Srimad Bhagavatam from a person who does not believe in the existence of the Lord. Such a person is already doomed, and any association with such a doomed person makes the associator also doomed. According to the Padma Purana, within the material compass, there are innumerable material universes, and all of them are full of darkness. Any living being, beginning from the Brahmas, there are innumerable Brahmas in innumerable universes, to the insignificant ant, are all born in darkness, and they require factual light from the Lord to see them directly, just as the sun can be seen only by the direct light of the sun. No lamp or man-made torchlight, however powerful it may be, can help one see the sun. The sun reveals itself. Therefore, the action of different energies of the Lord or the personality of God in himself can be realized by the light manifested by the causeless mercy of the Lord. The impersonalists say that God cannot be seen God can be seen by the light of God and not by man-made speculations. Here this light is specifically mentioned as vidyat, which is an order by the Lord to Brahma. But anyone who may be graced by the Lord to see such merciful, direct internal energy can also realize the personality of Godhead without any mental speculation. Are we still here? Anybody somewhere else? It's hard to follow such a deep philosophy for such a long period of time. I mean, the essence of this argument is that darkness is, is dependent on light, not independent of light. If you're standing facing the sun, there's no question of darkness, but as you turn away from the sun, then your shadow reflects light or, or causes a shadow. Therefore, the, the shadow was dependent on the light. Without the light, there would be no shadow. And without light, you can't see anything. This whole point about the reflection of light not lighting up the room, did you understand that? Like, just like if this room is dark, you know, and there's a reflection. Say, this, say it's dark, and the moon is very bright, and it's reflecting off a mirror, and there's a little stream of light coming into this dark room. How much of the room will it light up? Hardly anything. Even the sun, even if it's, the room's dark, you know, and the sun is just coming up, reflecting off, off of a mirror or something, and comes in. It only leaks a little stream and it can't light up the whole room. But as soon as the sun comes out, the whole room lights up.
So when Brahma comes into the material world, it's dark completely. But because the Lord is there and the Lord is, he, he's connected to the Lord through that, through that umbilical cord. And the, then everything comes through that, that lotus that he's sitting on is actually all the energies and all the, everything's there. And therefore there's a reflection of the Lord's light through that uh, connection into the material world and therefore we can see everything. Otherwise we wouldn't be able to see anything. So the point of the purport is that we shouldn't be proud of our ability to see anything because we really can't. Our, our ability to see is not independent of Krishna. Without Krishna you can't see anything. So how can we be claiming to be Krishna? Okay, text 35. Yata mahanti bhutani bhute shu chcha vasheshvanu pravishtan apravishtani tata teshu niteshvaham O Brahma, please know that the universal elements enter into the cosmos and at the same time do not enter into the cosmos. Similarly, I myself also exist within everything created and at the same time I am outside of everything. Purport. The great elements of material creation, namely earth, water, fire, air, and ether, all enter into the body of all manifested entities, the seas, mountains, aquatics, plants, reptiles, birds, beasts, human beings, demigods, and everything else materially manifested. And at the same time, <clears throat> such elements are differently situated. In the developed stage of consciousness, the human being can study both physiological and physical science, but the basic principles of such sciences are nothing but the material elements and nothing more. The body of the human being and the body of the mountain, as also the bodies of the demigods, including Brahma, are all of the same ingredients, earth, water, etc. And at the same time, the elements are beyond the body, the elements were created first and therefore they entered into the bodily construction later. But in both circumstances they entered into the cosmos and also did not enter. The example is given the womb of the mother. All the energy to, to create the body of the child is in the womb of the mother. So a part of that energy is used to create the body, and the, and there are, but there's part of the energy that stays outside that body, and it takes birth as a placenta. So it's inside the body and it's outside the body, at the same time. The elements were created first, and therefore they entered into the bodily construction later but in both circumstances they entered the cosmos and also did not enter. Similarly, the Supreme Lord by his different energies, namely the internal and external, is within everything in the manifested cosmos and at the same time he is outside of everything, situated in the kingdom of God by Kunta Loka as described before. This is very nicely stated in the Brahma Sangita as follows, Ananda chin maya rasa pratibha vithabis tabir ya eva nijarupata ya kalabihi goloka eva nifasat yakilat babuto govinda mari purusham tamaham bhajami. I worship the personality of Godhead Govinda, who, by expansion of his internal potency of transcendental existence, knowledge, and bliss, enjoys in his own and expanded forms in Goloka. Simultaneously, he enters into every atom of the creation. This expansion of his plenary parts is also more definitely explained in the same Brahma Samhita 535 as follows. 
ekopisau vachajitum jagadanta kotim yachchakti rasta jagadanta chaya yadantaha andanta rasta paramanu chayanta rastam govinda mari purusham tamaham bhajami I worship the personality of Godhead Govinda, who by one of his plenary portions enters into the existence of every universe and every particle of the atoms, and thus unlimitedly manifests his infinite energy all over the material creation. The impersonalists can imagine or even perceive that the Supreme Brahman is thus all-pervading, and therefore they conclude that there is no possibility of his personal form. Herein lies the mystery of transcendental knowledge of the personality of Godhead. This mystery is transcendental love of Godhead. And one who is surcharged with such transcendental love of Godhead can, without difficulty, see the personality of Godhead in every atom and every movable or immovable object. And at the same time, he can see the personality of God in his own abode, Goloka, enjoying eternal pastimes with his eternal associates, who are also expansions of his transcendental existence. This vision is the real mystery of spiritual knowledge, as stated by the Lord in the beginning of his instructions to Brahmaji, Sarahasyam Tarangamcha. This mystery is the most confidential part of the knowledge of the Supreme, and it is impossible for the mental speculators to discover it by dint of intellectual gymnastics. The, the mystery can be revealed through the process recommended by Brahmaji in his Brahma Samhita as follows. Premanjana Churita Bhakti Bilochanena Santak Sadaiva Vridayeshu Bilokayanti Yam Sham Masundara Machinti Gunasarupam Govinda Mari Purusham Tamaham Bajami. I worship the original personality of Godhead Govinda, whom the pure devotees, their eyes smeared with the ointment of love of Godhead, always observe within their hearts. This Govinda, the original personality of Godhead, is Shamasundra, with all transcendental qualities. Therefore, although he is present in every atom, the Supreme Personality of Godhead may not be visible to the dry speculators. Still, the mystery is unfolded before the eyes of the pure devotees because their eyes are anointed with love of Godhead. And this love of Godhead can be attained only by the practice of transcendental loving service of the Lord and nothing else. The vision of the devotees is not ordinary. It is purified by the process of devotional service. In other words, as the universal elements are both within and without, similarly the Lord's name, form, qualities, pastimes, entourage, etc., as they are described in the revealed scriptures or as performed in the Vaikuntha Lokas far, far beyond the material cosmic manifestation are factually being televised in the heart of the devotee. The man with a poor fund of knowledge cannot understand, although by material science one can see things far away by means of television. Factually, the spiritually developed person is able to have the television of the kingdom of God always reflected in his heart. That is the mystery of knowledge of the personality of Godhead. The Lord can award anyone and everyone liberation, mukti, from the bondage of material existence, yet he rarely awards the privilege of love of Godhead, as confirmed by Narada, muktim, this transcendental devotional service of the Lord is so wonderful that the occupation 
keeps the deserving devotee always wrapped in psychological activities without deviation from the absolute touch. Thus, love of Godhead developed in the heart of the devotee is a great mystery. Brahmaji previously told Narada that the, the desires of Brahmaji are never unfulfilled because he is always absorbed in the transcendental loving service of the Lord. Nor has he any desire in his heart save and accept the transcendental service of the Lord. That is the beauty and mystery of the process of bhakti yoga. As the Lord's desire is infallible because he is achuta, Similarly, the desires of the devotees in the transcendental service of the Lord are also achuta, infallible. This is very difficult, however, for the layman to understand without knowledge of the mystery of devotional service, as it is very difficult to know the potency of touchstone. A touchstone is rarely found. A pure devotee of the Lord is also rarely to be seen, even amongst millions of liberated souls. Koti Shapi Mahamune. Out of all kinds of perfections attained by the process of knowledge, yoga perfection in devotional service is the highest of all and the most mysterious also, even more mysterious than the eight kinds of mystic perfection attained by the process of yogic performances. In the Bhagavad Gita, 1864, the Lord therefore advised Arjuna about this bhakti yoga. Sarva guyatamam buyak shinu me paramam bachaha. Just hear from me again about the most confidential part of the instructions of the Bhagavad Gita. In Srimad Bhagavatam 2751, the same was confirmed by Brahmanchi Junarada in the following words, Idam Bhagavatam Nama Yanme Bhagavatoditam Sangraho Yam Vibhutinam Twam Etad Vipuli Kuru Brahmaji said to Narada, Whatever I have spoken to you about the Bhagavatam was explained to me by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and I am advising you to expand these topics nicely so that people may easily understand the mysterious bhakti yoga by transcendental loving service to the Lord. Now this may seem very mysterious. It is mysterious. It may seem far, far, far beyond us, but it's actually happening to each and every one of us as we sit here. Just think of just if not such a long time ago, when you had no idea of Krishna, then how much your vision has changed? What do you understand now? Even though you may not be seeing Krishna face in the heart yet by television, but how much more we're understanding than just a few years ago? How is that happening? If it isn't happening by the same process that's being discussed here, how is it happening? And, and then, as we get more and more vision, we think we know less and less. This is the mystery of devotional service. It is to be noted here that the mystery of bhakti yoga was disclosed by Brahmaji to the Lord himself. Brahmaji explained the same mystery to Narada. Narada explained it to Vyasa. Vyasa explained it to Shukadeva Goswami. And that same knowledge is coming down in the unalloyed chain of disciplic succession. If one is fortunate enough to have received knowledge in the transcendental disciplic succession, surely he will have the chance to understand the mystery of the Lord and that of the Srimad Bhagavatam, the sound incarnation of the Lord. So we'll end our reading there. 
we didn't get through the four, four ch verses, but we got through two, three of them, three out of four, pretty good. Okay, now we'll have our reflection time. Anything that stood out, that's a lot to hear and a lot to understand, but you all being pure devotees of the Lord, <coughs> Is there a question? Yeah, there is. But I think I yeah. There's a question of. We have a question from out in cyberspace from? Lily Blaylock. Lily? Yes. From Houston? Lily. Hey, Lily. Nice to see you, hear you. Or nice to. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, Lily and Carter, I miss you. But here we are together. Why is it stated that those who associate with people who don't believe in the Lord are also doomed? Okay. Why is it stated that those who associate with people who don't believe in the Lord are also doomed? Is there a way to share spiritual knowledge with those souls who are lost in the snares of ignorance and help them reach Godhead as well. Yes, because you become that transparent via medium and then you can help them and then they're not doomed. To the extent that you are Krishna conscious, people who come in contact with you will become Krishna conscious. And even if they don't inquire, even if you're just traveling around, because you're blissful and you look in their hearts and you see them as devotees or you see them as souls and you inter interact with them in that way they will they will tell the diff they can tell the difference and they start being like yeah they start being like your family practically because everybody is we're all in the same family but if we start treating people like we're in the same family and some of them will be turned off and you shouldn't be uh, depressed about that even if they are doomed because everything is being rightly done as it says in the Bhagavad Gita in the 11th chapter of Bhagavad Gita Krishna says and it's actually Arjuna who says that this, the demons flee away and it's rightly done because that's what they want that's what they deserve you can't force somebody to love another person so the, the, the answer is that if you become a pure devotee, Lily, which you actually are becoming a pure devotee really quickly, by the way, then in your association, other persons will become Krishna conscious or they'll become closer to Krishna. And that's what we want to do in Houston. We want to make Houston Krishna conscious. Hearts are flying. Good for you. <laughs> and you, you just had uh, 12 people simultaneously watching. Oh, nice. Yeah. From Taiwan also, Russia, Houston, more hearts and more thumbs. Oh, good. <laughs> there you go. Magic. You hear this Bhagavatam, Milili, you hear this Bhagavatam every day like this and you will become gradually and more and more enlightened and you'll be able to help people go back to Godhead. I wish you could see what's happening in Houston. It's, it's miraculous. <clears throat> we talk about it so much, but we're actually seeing it happen in it before our eyes. It's amazing. Hannah. Hannah. And she 
says those lost purports as everything. Correct. Except one more. There's going to be one more purport. And then when those <laughs> have been spoken, that's everything. Because the whole Bhagavatam is contained in those four purports and verses. <clears throat> okay, Alex has a question. He's going to type it out for us. He's a transcendentalist. His thoughts go through the keyboard. Hana, meanwhile, is going, oh, waiting for the fourth purpose. <laughs> Tomorrow night, Hannah. We're, we're remembering you fondly, Hannah. All of us. All of us. Yes, very good point, yeah. very good point. Vati Manjari is just saying that he, she's remembering one part of the her verse where uh, the, the Krishna is saying to Brahma, here again, and you remember in the Bhagavad Gita, at the beginning of practically every chapter, you know, Krishna says to Arjuna, here again, Arjuna, I'm going to tell you a little more, and then I'm going to tell you a little more, and finally, Arjuna says, okay, I'll do it, <laughs> whatever you say. <laughs> and when we come to that point, the clouds be, dis dissipate and we see the light. And then we can't be in darkness anymore. And wherever we go, we'll look and we'll see the reality. Even if we can't see Krishna face to face. I mean, Matt has exam. When we were traveling, I was so fired up from being with Hannah, Hannah, and the others, and Lily, and the others in Houston, that have come so so soon. And John and and Victor and and uh, Javier and on and on. I mean, there was a lot. Uh, Eduardo and Michael and. Yes, I mean it was it was like an explosion just over three or four weeks. Mm. All these they, they just came and they were each one of them was interested, and they kept coming and now they they're staying, they're coming, more and more. Anyway, I got distracted by myself. I interrupted myself and now I can't remember what I was going to say. You're yes, okay. Matt. No, okay. I interrupted myself. I do it all the time. This is, this the older you get, the more it'll happen. <laughs> all right. Um, Alex says, as far as I remember, Lord Brahma started performing his austerity when he, when he heard the two syllables tapa. How did he know what kind of austerity to perform? Because he should have performed a bona fide austerity, not of his own invention. It was not his own invention. Because later, Brahma, Krishna says, it was I who inspired you to do that austerity. Now, it is a good question, how did he know what to do? Because Tenhi Brahma Rida Yadikivya, from inside the heart, Krishna was outside and he was also inside. So he said tapa from outside and from inside he gave him the intelligence to know what it means because there was no, no one else in the universe at that time, just the two of them. But there's more to it than that, because Lord Brahma is the most intelligent living being in the universe. Because he became Lord Brahma from 100 lifetimes of performing his duty without making one mistake. And that pleased Krishna so much that he gave him the body, which has the capacity to engineer all the elements of the universe and created 
He's not the original creator. That's, that's what this whole thing is about. You know, Narada is his son, one of the first beings that came out of his body, the mind-born son of Brahma, right? And he's saying, Dad, <laughs> it looks like uh, everything's coming from you. Are you God? But I notice you're sitting in meditation. How is that? What's going on here? And this whole conversation is a result of that uh, question. And Brahma's explaining to him how what he did, you know, what happened, how how the Lord came to him. And so it's not that it's not that he's manufacturing out of thin air. He doesn't manufacture anything out of thin air. Correct. Only Krishna never becomes bewildered. Even Brahma and Shiva become bewildered by Krishna sometimes. I mean, Krishna does become bewildered by Radharani. I mean, sometimes he sees her and he goes, you know, kind of like head over heels and he becomes confused and he starts to try to milk the bull instead of the cow. <laughs> but that's a different kind of bewilderment. <laughs> that's not real bewilderment. <laughs> Correct. Exactly. Thank you. Lovely. Lovely reflection. Can I ask a small question? Yes, Rati Manjari has a question. Uh, I understood, uh, you were reading that the Brahma Jyoti is um, uh, reflecting the effulgence of the body of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And the uh, light of the Brahma Jyoti is being reflected by the sun and the moon and coming in this world. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I, I understood before, but wrongly, I guess, that the, the light of the sun, it, it doesn't emanate from the body of the sun at all, then? Yes, but it, it, that, is, that comes from, through, the the creative principle, the creative process. It's all coming through the creative process. The universe is covered mm -hmm. with huge mm, right. layers of so the light no light can come in. Therefore the only light that co can come in is coming from the Lord. The Lord comes in. Yes, and from that, and from his, from that, from his light, from his, the, 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 the emanation from him, all these things are emanations from him. Same thing, but in the Bhagavatam, it's ex, it's ex, it's unpacked, but it's the same thing. He says it seems Krishna is telling us how to come into knowledge, how to come into knowledge in Bhagavad Gita, and here he's giving it to us. No, he's also giving it to us in the Bhagavad Gita, but he's giving it to us in a more sutric form. It's more compressed. 
and it's, it's un uncompressed in the Bhagavatam, but it's the same knowledge. He's asking again? No, it's like he's here. Before. Yeah, before. So quite an international gathering. Yeah. Yeah. The United Nations of the spiritual world, Prabhupada said. We had that, that uh, sensation the last day of our reading in uh, Houston. There was like 16 of us and we were from such a diverse age and, and race and, you know, nationality and le level of, uh, level of uh, social whatever. And everyone was just together. We were all feeling like, just like we are right now. We're all feeling very much one, oneness, a kind of oneness that you can't get in any other way, actually. Because this has nothing to do with sense gratification. It's, the, it, it's coming from within, the heart. The, uh, yeah. Which confirms exactly what we just heard. Hare Krishna. Anything else? Yes. Sham Kishore. Go ahead. When it says, just hear from me, again about the most confidential part of the instructions in Bhagavad Gita. What's is that the most confident the chat on confidential? What does it say there? I just hear from me again about the most confidential part of the instructions in Bhagavad Gita. So, which part is then the confidential part of the instructions? Sarva Diamond Pritichaja, Mami Kam Shiranam I was wondering. Actually, that's the verse just before Manmana Baba Man Bhakto, Majaji Mam Namaskuru, Mami Vaisha Chasatya, Pritichane Prasis. So that's the most confidential. And that verse comes at the end of the chapter that is called the most confidential knowledge. Manmana Bhavamad Bhakti. That verse is repeated twice. At the end of the ninth chapter, at the end of the eighteenth chapter. It's all very systematic and all very organized and all very comprehensive. And every time you hear it, you can understand more, even though you're hearing the same thing. Is that because of the purification that we get through hearing? It's because it's there in the sound. It's just we're hearing more of it. That's all. Like and even if you're even if you're the same degree of purified. When you hear it, you'll hear more. Because it's Krishna. Krishna is unlimited. No, no, no. Krishna is unlimited. There's no limit. So the more you hear, the more you, you get you get him, you get it. Yeah. And not only that, but because he's in the heart, the thing that you get more is just what you need to learn at that moment. like the perfect teacher Krishna so all we have to do in our business is to become the perfect student you got something else over there Hmm? 
Yeah, go ahead. I was wondering uh, when Shri Prabhupada says that we can uh, see Krishna, what does, what, is, what does he mean by actually seeing Krishna? Mm. When you understand Krishna, it's not different than seeing him. When you hear his name, it's not different from seeing him. When you hear the Bhagavatam, it's not different from seeing him. Okay. It's just that your glasses, you need to change your prescription. <laughs> you, got a, you got a stigmatism and it's a little bit... <laughs> you, got a, you, got a, you got a cataract, you know, you got to remove the cataract. And that, that's a progressive. Mm. It's not just happening, just that same. Yeah. It's a yeah. yeah. But not just that, but hearing and understanding and accepting is not different than seeing Krishna. Mm -hmm. The form of Krishna is the same as his name and his philosophy and his entourage and his devotional service. So everyone who's hearing these things like this, we're all getting, we're seeing Krishna. Mm -hmm. It's just we're seeing to different degrees, of course. That's obvious. Beyond the beyond. It's beyond the beyond the beyond. <laughs> yeah, and that's the way it is, and that's the way it should be. But just by under just by trying to understand it, you know, pleasing pleases Krishna. In the Bhagavad Gita, in the in the the first of the four uh, seed verses of the Bhagavad Gita, uh, well, the second actually, Machchita Matkata Prana, Bodhyanta Parasparam, Katyeshta Chijam, Tushanti Charamantija. The, the, the uh, minds of the hearts of the pure devotees, they, they're full of Krishna and, they, and they, they love to hear about Krishna and share realizations about Krishna. And that's just exactly what we're doing right now. And so according to our capacities, we're tasting that. And you have a lot of capacity, more than you can imagine, and that capacity will increase until you will see Krishna face to face and in the spiritual world. And Krishna may withhold the vision of his personality, face to face vision, until you go back to him. He may. He doesn't. He he doesn't reveal that to very many persons, you know. But we shouldn't feel disappointed at that because hearing the Bhagavatam is not different, and that's what he wants us to admit. Rather than keep holding back our love until, when are you going to show me? You know, here he is giving himself through the Bhagavatam, like an unbelievably, you know, comprehensive you know, full exposition of, you know, as, as much as we can understand and more. And we're saying, well, okay, yeah, but when am I going to see a face? And it's like we, you know, we want him to be our order supplier, you know. Oh, Krishna, over here, come over here. Or, no, I want, to, I want to see you here now, right now, here. When he's come and he's, you know, do, you know given the Bhagavad Gita and been given the Bhagavatam, and, you know. You get this verse, you know. <laughs> you 
Yeah. This one, Alex. Uh, so I recently read in Srimad Bhagavatam 5.6.7, and there it says, Actually, Lord Rashabhadeva had no material body, but due to Yoga Maya, he considered his body material, and therefore, because he played like an ordinary human being, he gave up the mentality of identifying with it. We just said that Lord Krishna is never bewildered, but what does it mean here for him to consider his body material due to Yoga Maya? Yeah, it means he gives Yoga Maya permission to to uh, to allow that to happen, so that he can show us uh, something. That's Yoga Maya. Just like the same when when Radha, when Krishna sees Radharani, he becomes so bewildered with love that he forgets himself and he tries to milk a bull instead of the cow. So it's like that, only that's the highest manifestation of it, but it's the same principle, it's yoga maya. So we're covered by maha maya, which is an expansion of yoga maya. Therefore Krishna says in the Gita, naham, Prakasha Sarvasya Yoga Maya Samavitaha Mudho Yam Nabijanati Lokomama Jamakiyam. I I reserve the right not to be uh, seen by every just every anyone and everyone. I cover them by my Yoga Maya. So that Yoga Maya is actually Mahamaya. The Mahamaya covers completely Krishna the remembrance of Krishna, the knowledge of Krishna. You can't see Krishna at all. But Yoga Maya, Krishna's there, but there's a covering of that he's not God. You forget that he's God because the love is so sweet and so cherishable that it covers that uh, knowledge that he's God so that you can have a sweet uh, spontaneous, equal relationship with him. So Krishna can do anything. He, he never becomes bewildered, but he can do anything. He can appear like he's bewildered for a moment, if he wants to. If we have a material conception of God, well, he can't. It's like the, the philosophers try to trick you know, the, the devotees with questions like, could, can God create a, a, a weight that he cannot lift? It's a, it's a you know, riddle. It's like catch 22. Catch you, I mean, it's a gotcha question. If he can, then, you know, he's not God because he can't lift it. And if he can't, then he's not God because he can't do it. So the answer to the question is yes. He can create a weight that he can't lift, and the next moment he'll lift it. Because he's always expanding. His strength is always expanding. His opulences are always expanding. He comes into the material world, and he agrees to act like he's following time, in time and space, the laws of nature that he created himself. He's only in one place at one time. He moves from one place to another. So the devotees have to wait until he goes there to see him. It looks like he's in time and space. But at the same time, he has Aprakit Leela going on at the same time. And he can be with everyone at the same time. Therefore, it says he appears to be uh, there and he's not there. He's everywhere, at the same time, he's in one place, in the spiritual world. Just like the sun is in one place and is uh, generating light all over the universe, so he's in the spiritual world and he's, all of his energies are 
carrying out all these things at the same time. Therefore, he's simultaneously one with and different from everything. And you can't figure it out logically. You can't understand it by material intelligence. It can only be revealed to you. It's revealed knowledge, and that's what happened to Brahma. The knowledge was revealed to him how to create the universe. And, there, and it was in the he, he, Krishna revealed himself in the spiritual world when he became pleased with his penance. So our duty is to do our devotional service patiently and with determination and never stop under any circumstances with full faith. Our problem is our faith is weak and therefore when we get what we want then we're okay. We don't, then we stop. And Krishna's waiting. He says, no, nah, it's for you, it's not for me. It's not really for me, it's just for you. You want to see me so that you can enjoy rather acting like, you know, I want you to so that I can enjoy because that's your, the real position. But it's not that you won't enjoy. Then you'll really enjoy. It's not that, you, then you're thinking, or somebody's thinking, yes, but he's the enjoyer. He gets all the enjoyment. What about me? You know, I'm not. No, you'll enjoy ten million times more than him. And all you have to do is accept the fact. But we're clouded by our material logic and our material conditioning. And therefore, we, we don't really believe it. It says there was one part in there. One, remember that one proof? Yeah, yes, yeah. The, 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 the impersonalists, they say they, they say they, you know, accept God, but they don't. They don't believe it. They don't actually believe it. They worship Krishna, but they don't believe that he's really to exist. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to stop there. All right, Krishna, it's getting late. Thank you very much, everyone. It was a wonderful uh, reading and wonderful reflections, particularly from everyone out there in cyberspace. I'm so happy to interact with you. You know, it's very, very wonderful. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai, Lord Brahma ki jai, Sri Krishna ki jai, Go Premanandi, Hari Bari Hari Bol.